Hello, everyone. Hello. How you feeling? Good. What's up? What's up? We are back at New West Summit in Grand Ballroom 3. We have an epic conversation coming up on CBD. Yes, yes. Who, THC's unsexy boo cousin or a Cinderella story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're really excited for this conversation. There's so much to unpack about CBD. You have an amazing moderator, Mara Gordon, who is the founder of Aunt Zelda's, and she will be introducing the panelists and helping run this conversation. So give her a round of applause. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for on a first day of this, full day of this conference, coming out in the afternoon. If this is like where most people's blood sugar starts going down. I think CBD sometimes can help with that. You know, give it a shot. Give it a shot. So um, I, when I was looking at the title of this uh, panel discussion, I was thinking, oh my, where are we going to go with that? Because, um, you know, it's like, I remember back when I was in college, we used to say that if you don't know the answer, just put the Industrial Revolution and chances are you'd be right. And in the cannabis space, it seems like you can almost do that with CBD. You know, just whatever it is, yeah, CBD is the answer. And um, is it or isn't it? Does it have psychoactivity? Doesn't it have psych Does it have psychoactivity? You know, all that. Is it? Um, is that why people necessarily want to use cannabis? All those questions need to be addressed. But first, there's some real simple things that we're going to do. And I'm, I'm going to take a, uh, an opportunity here to just do a real quick um, overview of what's going on in the state of, of uh, CBD right now. And uh, I'm going to preface that with saying that whatever I say right now, you might walk out of here and find out that it's 180 degrees different because no one really knows for sure. And that is the legal um, uh, uh, position of hemp, CBD, cannabis, you know, or marijuana CBD, as the hemp industry says, cannabis versus hemp, as as the as the cannabis or the marijuana space says. So either way, um, the FDA has just rescheduled um, cannabis, or excuse me, CBD, um, with three caveats. Number one, it has to be FDA approved. Number two, it has to be um, uh, derived from cannabis, it has to have less than 0.1% uh, of THC. And there's only one product in the world, so basically they rescheduled for Epidiolex for GW Pharma. So that really didn't do anything for the rest of us, us other than to lead, lead to further confusion around um, where the federal government is going to step in. Uh, the hemp right now is under the farm bill. Um, and the, those that extract under pilot programs and university programs for hemp CBD, or CBD derived from hemp, are doing it under the auspices of being covered by the Farm Bill. Those that are doing it in uh, states like California that are extracting it from, uh, let's just say, plants that would have to be in the regulatory market of the, of the, of the genome of cannabis sativa, um, they're having to go through the full licensed facility, licensed manufacturing, paying all the taxes along the way, just like any other cannabinoid. It's not treated any differently. So this is not the forum where you're going to get that definitive answer um, on how, what the legal uh, position of it is right now. Everybody has an opinion, and we know what that's all about. And a lot of companies are building their their business plans and their structures and their marketing around their positions on it, and but it's yet to see. Uh, there's hints that after the midterm elections that we'll see some shift in this at a federal and at a California state. Um, but that's just you know. I want to ask you real quickly: um, How many people in here are industry uh, uh, in the industry itself? Okay. How many of you are manufacturers? How many of you are um, in the, on the hemp side of things? Okay. And how many of you are kind of curious? Yeah, yeah. 
It's like the people that are just, you know, because you see the name, you see the people, and it's like everything they hear today is going to be the first thing you've ever heard, and God help us. So anyway, so instead of, I have, I have five amazing people on this panel, each with a beautiful, deep background, and each brings something unique to this space. So instead of me, you know, botching reading their bios, um, what we've done is we've come up with some uh, key points that we want to make sure that are covered in here. And I'm pulling them up right now. I apologize. Take me a second. We're going to look at things like, for example, um, isolate versus distillate. Um, what's the difference and does it matter? We're going to be looking at the entourage effect from the standpoint of, you know, that'll be part of that question there. We're going to look at um, some of the health claims. Is it, in fact, psycho uh, is there psychoactivity associated with it? And does it make a difference if it's from cannabis or hemp? These are the kind of issues that we're going to be addressing in here. And each one of our esteemed panelists will be taking five minutes to go through and um, talk, tell about who they are and where they are on, on these positions. And then we'll open it up for some Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I have here directly to my right, Arup. Do you like to take it from here? Do you have a here? Oh, it's on. Um, good afternoon. My name is Arup Sen. I am very new to the industry over the last 44 years since getting my PhD in biochemistry. I've been primarily in the biotech and pharmaceutical industry. So it's kind of interesting that about 35 years later, I come back to California pretty much in the same location where the biotech industry started, who were back then told by the pharma industry that there is nothing called biotech because proteins don't work as drugs. So it's nice to see that about 40 years later in my career, I'm coming back to look at a molecule that's related to the one that I used back in 1977, Delta 98C, to treat brain tumor cells. Um, but today's focus obviously is on CBD, and obviously the other panelists are a lot more familiar with the cannabis market perspective on CBD. I look at the plant cannabis, hemp, the whole family as a medicinal plant, which probably is going to be the source from the recreational social perspective of products or preparations that will match or exceed tobacco and alcohol industry. And from the biotechnology pharmaceutical perspective, it will most likely be the only solution to our opioid crisis that we have right now. And those are the reasons I got into this space about two and a half years ago. I remain concerned about all the confusion that was just mentioned not the least of which is the regulatory confusion. And again, as we all know, if you leave anything to the government, it is sure to get you know what up. Uh, and that has been done successfully statewide and federally. Hopefully, you know, just like what we did back in the late 70s, early 1980s, work with the FDA to come up with what we called then points to consider for biotechnology products, because there were no guidelines at that point. Uh, hopefully we can start a dialogue like that, start defining some of these molecules, speak real science, not all the anecdotes that go around. And I think you'll hear about some of those, like isolate, distillate, what's different, what's not. Um, my perspective on CBD is, it is a chemical molecule. As long as it's a, the molecule, it should not matter where it comes from. The interesting part, though, is that chemically synthesized CBD chemically synthesized Delta 9-THC have been around for four decades. Neither has worked. So there is something very unique about these molecules when you get them from nature. It could be as trivial as a very, very, very minor contaminant that is somehow active or changing the activity that is only obtainable when you get it from a natural source like GW Pharma has done and has done a fantastic series of clinical trials Hence, it got approved, and in fact, it's one of the rare drugs where the entire 13-member advisory committee unanimously supported the approval of the drug. That, in my history, has been rare to happen. So with that, I'm going to turn over to my next guest, and hopefully we'll see more new, new thoughts.
We, we all have our own microphones. This is good. This is going to get messy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know it's uh, early, and uh, it's CBD. So, Marvin, how are you, man? <laughs> My name is Christopher Hussey. I'm the director of communications for a company called Isidal International. I've been uh, in the industry since 2013. Um, I have a bit of a different perspective, possibly. I know we are in the the heart of where the movement comes from, and I have an absolute respect for that. My perspective is best illustrated maybe in a story. It's a simple story. So about a year ago, sometimes I create t-shirts for myself. I don't know if anybody's weird like that, but I'll go on and have my designers create a thing, and then I'll just print a t-shirt, and I'm the only one wearing it. So I created this t-shirt, and on the t-shirt it says, I'm on a mission, and then underneath it it says, ask me about CBD. And so I threw it on, I'm doing a training online somewhere, and a bunch of people were like, hey, can I grab the t-shirt? Well, that t-shirt really does illustrate my belief. I believe that every person on the planet needs access to cannabinoids, and they need access to put it in their body and use it the way that they want to use it. Now, from that perspective, though, I also believe that the greatest force in education and distribution is a word called marketing responsible marketing. So when you responsibly market something, when you use truth and you deliver the actual benefits, you can expand a marketplace. And by expanding a marketplace, you get believers. And what happens with believers is anytime they believe, they then decide that they are going to learn more. So without being long-winded, I believe that CBD is the gateway to the entire world understanding the whole plant. And I believe that the opposite is not true. And I think if you really think about from that perspective, if you think about what's happening, we have a less than 10% cannabis aware marketplace. Less than 10% of the world will say, I love, respect, will use, am interested in cannabis. The other 90% are either not interested, don't care, or will push it away in some fashion. CBD is the way that we get that 90% to put a cannabinoid in their body, have something that changes their life, get interested in such a way that they, get, they then go, what is ECS? What is the endocannabinoid system? What are these other cannabinoids? Maybe I should look at CBG. Maybe I should look at CBN. Maybe I should check out THC. Maybe I should check out this entire spectrum and how I can use it with everybody in my body. So if you look at the regulatory landscape, and again, we're not going to get into that, but I think there are some very specific truths in the regulatory landscape. THC is not going to be legal federally in 50 states anytime soon. It's just not going to happen. I love you if you believe that, but it's not going to happen. CBD is going to be legal in the next 12 months. I believe it's legal today, but that's a different conversation. Buy me a beer, I'll tell you how it's legal today. We've shipped to all 50 states for over 10 years. I've been on the phone with every regulatory body in the world, and we do it every day, and we do it to millions of dollars. CBD will be available to the entire public, and that public, if we market responsibly and effectively, we can grab the entire marketplace and then educate that entire marketplace to love the whole plant. How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> Is this thing on? Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Maruchi Lachance, and um, I think I'm going to take a page from this gentleman here, and I'm going to share a personal story rather than bore you with all of the stuff on my CV. Um, I actually have been in the nutraceutical space for since 2012, and the way that I came to uh, the canna space was through um, a meeting at the University of Miami with parents and caregivers and medical professionals that were trying to find a solution for their children who had epilepsy and had heard about this great new thing that was going to save them. Um, I was, I'm one of those people that I was actually indifferent about marijuana and CBD. I never really used marijuana, sorry, boo. Um, but. So when I came to this meeting, I really, I was like, oh, they're going to try to sell me this about how wonderful it is, and I'm not going to buy into it. I'm just going to leave continuously being indifferent. What transpired was I went from indifferent to crazy passionate. 
Um, I sat in a room with children and parents, children seizing, parents that were in their 20s, their 30s. They were beat down. They were worn out. They were, they were just devastated with the way that their lives had changed. And I knew right then and there that I needed to be a part of this. Uh, the company that we were currently in, which was a Nutra company, we were doing gums. We were really uh, passionate about delivery systems and about efficacy. And my partner and I just looked at each other after that meeting and we went, we are going to change our lives right now. Uh, we understood that we needed to enter into this space. We needed to bring every little bit that we knew, every penny that we had, that we had invested, and we needed to bring it into the, the cannabis side, or excuse me, the CBD side in our case. But we've got our eye on cannabis, just so you know. Uh, so what happened after that was just a labor of love. We, we got here to call, excuse me, we got to Colorado and it was 2015 and we visited so many uh, people in the CBD space and we just created a really nice community. We um, learned a lot. We didn't roll in thinking we knew everything and that was probably the best thing that we did. We made friends. We understand that, at least for me, at that point, I didn't feel that we had competitors. I felt that we had, that we were actually just um, trying to collaborate. And I still feel that way. I still feel like we are, all of us here, I just genuinely believe that we're stewards of this very, very important industry. I think that we have to work together until everything is regulated and it's a level playing field. And again, I, I think that what we're doing is tremendously important and we just have to continue to focus on making this legal on you know please go vote please talk to people in your in your families because they're the ones that go vote and just spread the word about this um, but I, again I feel very privileged to be sitting here with with all of these individuals and to be sharing my story with you and um, talk to me afterwards and I'd love to you know ramble on some more about this <coughs> Good to be here. Uh, my name is John <clears throat> John Rulak. Um, I live here in the Bay Area. How many people here uh, live in the Bay Area? Good portion. Great. Yeah, it's a great place. Um, uh, I've been a longtime environmental uh, entrepreneur um, since my 20s, um, and been interested in the in the hemp plant, kind of coming from from an environmental perspective. I was a forest activist in the late 80s and 90s, and people are always asking, "Well, you're not going to cut down the trees. What are you going to build your house out of?" <clears throat> and this hemp plant, I started hearing about that in the early 90s. Uh, and then I went to a bioresource uh, hemp conference in Germany in 1995. And that was just like, opened my eyes up to, wow, there's hemp building materials and there's insulation and you can build cars with it. It's like, and it grows and it's easy to grow and you can make food out of it. So that was a real eye opener. I wrote a book called uh, Industrial Hemp. There's like a hemp museum. Uh, display out here. I had my little book in 1995 and then written three books on hemp. I've uh, been primarily focused really on the seed and the fiber. I, I, I formed a little company called Nativa back in 1999 with 500 hemp bars and and uh, we grew to 100, 100 million dollars 15 years. Uh, pretty fast growth but focused on, on the seed. And it was always like <clears throat> the flower and the THC and we're like no we're not a drug crop and just trying to convince uh, you know, uh, mainstream American retailers that this is not a this is not what they call a drug crop or whatever, and and so we're pretty we're pretty successful mainstreaming uh, hemp foods and and now it's in you know thousands of stores, uh, and I stepped down as CEO uh, about a year ago and kind of was enjoying my retirement, uh, definitely not having to look at spreadsheets and dealing with lawyers and HR issues, uh, and then this then I decided to well I think I maybe I'm ready for 2.0. So I started a little company called um, RE Botanicals, uh, which is the or pure organic hemp apothecary. So I'm focusing on the flower now, on, on the hemp side, and uh, we're we're just going to set up a, we're setting up our operations in uh, Boulder. Uh, so we're growing, processing, and and uh, producing there in Boulder. And our our focus is literally today, 80 percent of all hemp grown in in the United States is grown with chemical fertilizers. When you grow with chemical fertilizers, 300 times uh, worse than CO2 uh, using anhydrous ammonia fertilizer. Most of the these hemp farmers, um, you know, they're they're Monsanto people. They use, you know, Roundup, you know, in the soil. They're growing GMO corn, you know, a lot of that stuff. And there's a lot of people in our industry. It's kind of like the Wild West. It's like it's like people make a lot of claims. So 
my goal and our company <coughs> is can we switch that 80% of non-organic to 80% organic? Um, and uh, so our, right now we're kind of assembling a team of experienced organic CPG people who, are in the, who know the natural food world. Um, and we're kind of coming, coming with that perspective. And um, so uh, in, in terms of the CBD, I, I tell people it's a bit like toothpaste. The CBD, is, it's squeezed out. It's really hard to put toothpaste back in. <clears throat> um, three years ago, if you would ask me, is CBD going to be marked in the U.S. nationwide to be legal? I'd say, I'm not quite sure. I, I think the pharmaceutical industries, if they have anything to say, if they're smart, they're going to shut this down. But they were sleep, they've been asleep at the wheel the last couple of years. I, I don't know like, why they didn't get the feds to come out and knock down people's doors and cause a lot of trouble. And I know they're, they're trying to do that, believe me. There's a lot of, lot of things that are going on now about that, but too many Americans are using this product and getting great results. I mean, just myself, I, I kind of used to think CBD, there was like, these CBD people, this is, this is, I mean, what they're saying, is this really true? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of claims. I started taking a lot in the last six months. Like my basketball game, I play with 20, 30 year old guys. My basketball game is better than it's been three or four years, you know? It's like, my, and, and I feel it really, there's something to that. Now I'm working out and doing different things, but. I just, there's a lot of people getting a lot of, a lot of positive results. So I think, I tell people in the natural food world, this is gonna be bigger than vitamins. Um, it's, it's gonna be, it's like, and there's so many companies that are just waiting. They're like waiting, like is it 45 days, 90 days, or 120 days when that bill gets signed? Uh, and Mitch McConnell, he wants this to get signed and he's the most powerful legislator and, and, and uh, you know, regardless of what we might think of him, some of his other politics, he wants hemp for the Kentucky farmers, and that's going to help him get elected. So once this gets approved, guns fired, and, and the race begins. And, and so it's, there's going to be huge amount of demand, and there's going to be a lot of acres coming on. And at some point, there's going to be shortages, and then there's going to be massive surpluses. Or it's, No one really knows how it's all going to go. There's a lot of different claims, and uh, I think... Um, purity is going to be important and trust uh, and I'm just looking forward to participating in, in this. One of the things we're doing a little differently is we're putting 1% of our sales to regenerative agriculture. So we're going to put our revenue to teach farmers how to heal the soil. And, um, Great stuff. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, my name's Ian, uh, CEO of a company called Medican. We have a product called Hemp Fusion. Uh, we're about 2,300 stores nationwide. And um, kind of interesting just like how we got to where we did. Uh, I actually, probably eight years ago, I made a small investment into a company that ended up building the first CO2 extractors for cannabis uh, with Eden Lads and, and uh, the folks who ended up going on to start Apex, Andy and whatnot. And uh, kind of through that whole process, I, I was fascinated by, wow, for the first time in thousands of years, we can take something that people generally associate as like a green plant material or a pretty crude hash extract that was primarily uh, used to get high. And all of a sudden, we can take it into a standardized product, which should take almost any form in the world. Uh, the, the possibility of that and, and what that opened up, I thought was pretty incredible. Uh, you know, from there, um, we as a team uh, worked in many different states in places like New York, Illinois, Nevada, Washington, uh, installing labs, writing applications, um, you know, dealing on processing really where that green plant stopped and where that finished product uh, began. And, um, you know, I got really frustrated in the kind of fits and starts that the industry was, was growing through and just constant changes in legislation and taxation and uh, you know, lack of basic services to build a business like banking and credit card processing and access to, to credit. And, uh, you know, this is still early stage, maybe five, six years ago when it was pretty hard to imagine the, the speed in which this industry was about to grow. And I think all of that growth was driven on actual results that people were getting from these products, like a, a serious demand for uh, access to this. Um, so I, I was kind of fascinated at that point of how can we from this like really infantile industry that's just barely, you know, getting its first breath, how might we be able to tap into the, the real levers of, of industry and commerce? Like the, the, the levers that allow all of these what they call consumer packaged goods, CPG, 
um, you know, to find their way into the lives of hundreds of millions of people in the United States and, and globally. And these are, you know, we're talking about serious distributors, serious retailers, online channels, these, you know, 80 years of evolution that have, have grown into um, an industry that puts products on hundreds of thousands of shelves every single day. And, uh, and, and was it possible to take this type of product, this type of ingredient that was having such incredible impact in people's lives and, and channel it through uh, you know, those really well-developed systems rather than you know, going one state at a time, what felt like one trench at a time? Um, you know, so about, I guess, four and a half, five years ago, I had contracted a group in, um, out of uh, New York, which was uh, one of the top natural products consulting firms, um, to look at the viability of this. So was it possible to derive this from hemp in the sense that was legal under the DEA's uh, definition of hemp? So controlled substance acts, stock, seed, and stem, uh, you know, naturally occurring levels, all these different things, like these bunch of boxes we needed to check. Um, through a, a partnership in, in Europe um, with the largest ingredient supplier in Europe who's an investor in us, a company called Dolor. Uh, we put together a supply chain and uh, ended up launching um, Hemp Fusion. And uh, we, we created products for stress, for sleep, for digestive health, trying to you know, really bring this, this message to people who had maybe considered trying this or heard of somebody you know, who had benefited from it and, uh, you know, and really let them know, hey, this is something that's safe, it's accessible, it's not going to get you high. Um, and you know, I had the same experience where we, we started this story from from really basic, just like you know, where you were probably 10, 15 years ago with hemp as a food. No, it won't get you high. Yes, it's legal. Uh, you know, really basic understanding. And in the last few years, we've seen this thing evolve to where we'll go in and you know, we're speaking with major, major retailers and, and distributors, and all of a sudden, they know what it is. They know they want it. They've seen the sales data. Um, like we've, we've taken 80% of the explaining away, and now there's is it legal? Why is it legal? How's it work? What's the pricing, right? And um, so I, I don't think there's been any ingredient that has has moved this this quickly ever uh, in natural products. I think what we're seeing in the United States um, is going to happen globally, and I think we're going to see this ingredient transition from channels, whereas like you know many new innovative ingredients start in a particular channel, whether it's drug or natural. You know this is something that we're seeing explode in natural conventional, convenience, drug, pharmacy, clinics. Um, so, I mean, the potential here is unbelievable, and the, I just think the ability of markets to meet demand is incredible, and, um, you know, we're about to see some pretty amazing things in the next five, ten years, and I think CBD is just the beginning of that story. I, I agree with you. I think it's the bridge. Um, so, that's where we are. That's who I am. So, oh, I'm battery. sorry. This one, the battery's dead. Okay, that's, that's it. Um, so, you know, I don't, don't know who really came up with the idea of certified industrial hemp as three-tenths of a percent or less THC in a plant dry material without defining what that is. So, as of now, at least in my mind, all of the stuff other than Epidolex, which has been approved by the FDA, is Schedule One. So we just need to be careful, figure out what the molecules are, how do we get it to a point where it can be made available to people. Can I make a point? 
So I, I believe that nomenclature is important. I believe that we are working with an uneducated audience for the most part, even people who are very into marijuana or very into the industry. Our nomenclature is all over the place. It's ridiculous. Um, hemp is cannabis. Hemp is cannabis. There isn't, hemp, there isn't cannabis and hemp. There's cannabis. And then there are deviations of cannabis that are legally certified as marijuana or hemp. So I would love it if we could all teach the world that it's all cannabis. Right. And then underneath cannabis, we work with different plants or different strains or different whatever we end up working with or different right. molecules. Which is why I asked, yeah. are you going through the regulatory as a cannabis or are you doing it through hemp under the farm Isodial bill? Isodile as a company, so, everything that we do yeah. is 100% right. industrial hemp. So um, I, want, I was over in uh, Eastern Europe a couple of years ago and they took me to the Royal Academy of I don't remember and uh, took me on a tour of their hemp extraction facility and uh, they were very excited and they were showing me the big giant bags, burlap bags, and they're like putting their hands going, yeah, this is all what we're processing. You know, and of course we're, we're ISO 7, we're GMP, I mean, and I'm like looking at the way they're handling this. And I said, so where is this being sourced from? And they told me, and I said, so you're testing for heavy metals, right? You're testing for all these things. Oh no, when we make it down into an isolate, it's not necessary. And I say, thank you very much. This has been enlightening. And of course, I never did business with them. Um, so I think now I'd actually like to just turn this for John. If you could lead this next uh, question on looking at isolate versus distillate. And then I'd like to kind of, first of all, let's get a definition because I don't think everybody really understands the difference between an isolate and distillate. And then what the role is and how that I impacts on quality. Yeah, it's a good, uh, good point. There's a lot of different terms thrown out and, and different things. Uh, just one, uh, uh, one point of caution for people about, about some of the products in the market. There was a top uh, laboratory at the, uh, the Southern Hemp Expo uh, that was on a panel I was listening to, and they said that um, they've, been, they've been seeing a lot of these tests that certain brands were setting, sending in you know, for heavy metals and uh, um, um, you know, contaminants, and they kept seeing this one imprint, you know, fingerprint of, of uh, a chemical, and it was the same one for multiple companies. And essentially, this person was making, some company in the U.S. today, a large company, is making an isolate. Not all companies are this, but this was this company, and they're using paint thinner. And this, this lab is trying to, has been talking to their clients saying, can you at least maybe give me like a burner phone? I want to just talk to them to help them to make a better improvement, and, he, and they won't do it. So um, uh, there's some real challenges, you know, in, in terms of some of the some of the quality. But you know, in, in general, uh, you know, people are focused uh, more in the for like a lower cost and a quicker way to produce and isolate isolated the CBD and and don't have the kind of the entourage effect of other cannabinoids. So that's one pathway. You know, it, it has a better flavor. It has some of these other reasons. Uh, there's a lot of people, especially in the organic uh, food world, and the kind of come come from more of the apothecary perspective, which is where I come from. As we're more interested in less processing, we'd like to see the more the entourage, all the different things. Now, sometimes when you do filter, you are going to take out some of the waxes or some of the terpenes, but um, I think we don't, we still don't know what is it that causes some of these effects, uh, that the positive results, and I and. My sense is, is that people are getting results to, you know, in, in different types of processing. Some may be better and, and some maybe not as much, but um, uh, that's, that's something that's going to get worked out into the, in the marketplace and communication. And uh, yeah, so it's going to be definitely going to be interesting. Thank you. Anybody else like to talk about isolate versus distillate? Um, I guess I could just say a couple things on it. So, um, yeah, so in, in our interpretation of the way that FDA regulations read under DSHEA, which is a Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, we think it's, um, you know, fairly, uh, I don't know, dangerous, I guess, to be concentrating, isolating, standardizing to any one molecule, especially something like CBD. 
Um, and so our perspective on that is the same in that we use the absolute minimal amount of processing possible. We try and keep it as naturally occurring uh, as would be found in nature, unconcentrated, unstandardized. Um, and then of course we do a tremendous amount of testing when it comes to heavy metals and, and pesticides um, and the like. So um, you know, for us we try to uh, neither distill or isolate. So I have, I have a question for you on that. Um, if you're using distillate, where you're keeping the profile of the plant to the most part, obviously certain ones, I mean, you have terpenes that disappear the second that they hit the air, I mean, that they hit temperature. But for the most part, you're keeping the profile very similar. How would you be able to standardize your products so that people have the same experience each time they have them utilizing a whole plant? Uh, so we don't... Okay, yeah, so for us particularly, um, we don't. Uh, we, we treat our products the way that you would treat a, a protein powder or a whole food. So um, we offer what we sell in a typical nutritional profile. So we're not saying this is exactly what you are finding in this product. We're saying this is about what you would expect to find in this product. Um, so with that, we you know, guarantee that, for instance, that there's in most of our capsules, there's at least five or 10, depending on the product, uh, milligrams of CBD, about equal levels of things like beta caryophyllin. Um, we, we pull terpenes from black pepper and clove, uh, you know, other types of botanicals to try and recreate that profile, maybe enhance that profile in certain ways. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we are not saying this is exactly the same product. It will be exactly the same every single time and you'll have the exact same results. I, I don't think we're uh, qualified to say that at this point. Um, I love that answer. We are the opposite, and we believe the opposite, actually. But going back to my original statement, we believe the opposite because we believe that both the legal process and the educational process is about getting people to get this in their body. And so products, are, products in retail are based upon having the same effect every time. That's what they're based on. I love the, I, I would rather call it the ensemble effect rather than the entourage effect. Um, entourage, and I heard this in, on an earlier panel and I loved it. Entourage kind of means that THC is the big boy and everybody else is hanging out with him. I like ensemble effect. We're all just hanging out, having a good time together. I like that word. So, so, <laughs> um, I, I would have to say that's an opinion, I, it, not, right, a, not an actual I, definition. Right, it's not a definition. Last time right, I spoke on, with Raphael right, Mishulam, it opinion. didn't have anything it's to do opinion. with THC said, as the big guy. Right, it's an opinion. Yeah. It's an opinion, right. It's an opinion. So the point behind that is while I, I buy into that and I think it, it's real and I understand it, that doesn't get us further down the road. That actually gets us back down the road. That is the reason why, in my opinion the legislation is not further because we cannot say this does this and this does this and this does this. But when you isolate the molecule, whichever one it is, whether we're talking about CBD or THCA or whatever molecule we're talking about, when you isolate it, you can begin to get the legalization. You can begin to, begin to say it does this in this quantity for this amount of people. You can have the studies and you can prove the science. And by doing that, people will buy in and once a person is, bu is bought in, you can then say, oh, have you met my friend THC? Have you met my friend CBG? And then educate them, and we can build the whole marketplace. I, I guess I would go back to John's comment earlier. Um, I think the problem in this field as of now, in spite of the fact that some of us would like to believe that we have isolated CBD, we haven't. The, standards in this industry are far from our what api it needs to in be. the uk would argue with that because we have a pharmaceutical grade api from the uk and gw pharmaceuticals has a pharmaceutical grade api in america and we have a pharmaceutical grade api in brazil so those governments around the world would disagree with you well that that's okay oh, well, that must make it right so right said, so. <laughs> I mean, right so so, so did a lot of people with thalidomide back in 1962 that's got all right i think i think there is always a difference in opinion. Um, I think we are trying to correlate a poorly defined substance with a set of poorly defined outcomes. I would much rather take the wine approach where 
wine is universally consumed, and nobody cares about the 13% alcohol, but a Gurgitschel 1982 Cabernet is still an incredibly lovable wine, whereas an 87 Sauvignon Blanc from some crappy winery in Florida, where I live, uh, <laughs> is not very attractive. <laughs> okay, so I think we, we need to step back a little bit instead of getting too caught up in the level of science we have done so far in this industry and really go back to some of the basics and say this plant variety, be it blueberry kush for CBD or, or, or THC or Charlotte's Web for CBD, these are the outcomes that I was looking for. We don't know what else is happening because we don't know what it should be looking for. That'll come out later. So I think as of now, the better approach would be to say, we have preparations, these are beautiful plants, they all carry a whole host of different cannabinoids, terpenes, we don't know what everything does, but this plant does this, that plant does that, that plant does that, and try to get into the science as time goes on. Um, Murchie, do you have any comments on this at all? Anything you'd like to add? I think I'm in agreement with everyone and still kind of my own opinion is, I am a big fan of the, um, the full hemp spectrum. I am kind of a purist, if you will. I like to be able to provide something that takes care of a lot of things. When you isolate, you know, you're kind of just focusing on, on one particular thing. Uh, but we work with all of it. Again, what we're trying to accomplish, I think all of us sitting here is, we do want to bring this very important ingredient into our society. We want to bring it as, as, a, as a natural solution to a lot of the issues that so many of us are having, whether it's um, health, whether it's a terminal situation. So I come from a very different place. I come from the kumbaya, whatever my clients want, whatever my, uh, whatever my consumers and my customers want, that's what I'm going to produce. And I'm going to, to your point, young man over there, and I'm going to produce it as safely and as healthfully as I possibly can. Right. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. So I love your answer, by the way. We don't agree, but I love your answer. Um, so let me, let me actually ask you a question that I think really comes from your answer. If I get the same seed of the same, pick your favorite strain, and I grow it in Northern California under certain conditions, and I take that same seed of that favorite strain, and I go to Boston, and I grow it under different conditions, the profile of those two plants are going to be entirely different. How do we address that in the marketplace? Okay, let's take that a little further, shall we, and say you can grow them in on exactly the same plot of land and have, and have one that is a different profile at the top of the hill than from the bottom, or the flower at the top of the plant from the middle to the bottom. So it's a given that there's gonna be a variation as long as we're working with a live plant that has its own environment and all these other issues. So that's, that's a given. There, aren't other, there is not the expectation of, of, of having it be the identical uh, in other areas of nutraceuticals. For example, you order a bottle of, of purely holistic curcumin. One time it comes, it might be kind of reddish, one time it comes, it might be kind of orange. One time it comes, it might have a funny smell or whatever. They all contain the same amount of curcumin, but it's a profile of the whole plant is going to be slightly different. And I think in the nutraceutical space, the consumers are, are kind of accustomed to this and not having an expectation. So um, there's a lot of health claims that are being made around CBD. And um, we, as an industry, or set of industries using, working with various cannabinoids, have a responsibility to the general public to not make claims that have not been substantiated. The way that we substantiate in modern times, um, you know, post-single molecule Bayer aspirin, for example, um, is through double-blind clinical trials. We all know that that's very limited. So is it, is it responsible for us to be making health claims about CBD, and if not, or if yes, sure, tell me why, and if not, um, how do we go about getting the information out while we're all speaking doublespeak because we're, our hands are tied to actually speak about the health benefits? Mm -hmm. 
So I want to say that the government has been one of our best advertisers because they have put CBD on the map. And I was surprised when I first stepped into the industry as to how many people already knew about CBD because there was, it was the forbidden fruit and the government didn't want it. And so people started to research it. I really don't find myself having to tell people what it does because so many people already come up to me and tell me. I've been on Google. I know everything that it does. The other item to this is they're not Googling, you know, Fran's happy canna blog. They're actually going to legitimate publications and they are seeing actual studies where all of these things are supported. So that's my take on that. So I just wanted to add one thing. I, I, I don't remember the, this company, but I met someone at the uh, Expo East uh, uh, CBD uh, Summit show uh, last month. And it's a company that's coming up, someone's coming from the pharmaceutical background and they have like this consumer site uh, where they're gonna work with CBD brands and, and they'll be collecting the data, not the CBD companies, and they'll do it in such a way that, that, um, that they can kind of find uh, what information and, and do, it in a, do it in a kind of systematic way. That's an interesting platform. I know several of the companies are gonna participate in that. So. That's, a, that's one positive uh, that, that's just getting going. That, that's a way to kind of collect information. But it, it is a pers perspective, you know, perplexing issue. And I mean, we, we face the same thing in, in the coconut oil world, you know, that we've, we've actually been sued for, for, for saying coconut oil is, uh, you know, 100% less cholesterol than, than butter. You know, I, I think it's like about 30, 40,000 a month on that one. Um, and, and, and so there's a lot of, the trial lawyers and CBD is going to be, it's like it's going to have a big, big X on, on the companies that, that are doing well, and they're going to really look at all that. And they don't care. They have no interest, these lawyers, truth, not truth, science or not science. They're just looking for a payday. So, um, you know, when I, as, I, as, I, as I go forward with our new company, I'm going to be, a, 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 you know, you know, particular and in, in how, how we follow that. I encourage everybody to just not get too far ahead of, on that um, because uh, it's no fun uh, dealing with those issues. Ma'am? Yeah. Ian, do you have anything yeah. you want to say? Sure. Say it before. Sorry. I guess just, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a super quick on that. I guess, uh, you know, I think for us as an industry, um, we're so tiny. Like, we, we kind of think of ourselves like, oh, wow, we're out here doing this thing, but we're just a little... We don't even register. And, um, and the thing we need to be really, really careful uh, about is being snake oil salesmen. And, and what I really have kind of come to, to dislike is when I go online and I'm looking for this or that and I'm always searching for where my product is in search ranking. So I see everyone else's product. And, uh, and it really bothers me when everyone's like, it cures cancer and anxiety and this and that and this and this and this and this and this. And you know what? Maybe it does. You know, but... Uh, but the problem is, is like particularly those types of things, um, most of the world is not Northern California. And when you're out in Indiana and Missouri and Arkansas and places where I go and like work, like if you tell them that something cures cancer, they're going to call BS and they're going to say that's snake oil. And, and so I think, you know, we need to give this a chance to prove itself without over preaching and over uh, committing ourselves and this molecule and this plant and just like let it go out there a little bit and, and, and do its magic and uh, I don't think we need to claim it so hard so I actually I actually agree with that a billion percent I would I would go even further and again I, I started this by talking about retail you know there are there are inroads into the marketplace that do not have medicinal claims on CBD or any of the molecules. And that, you know, there are plenty of things that companies can make medical claims on, and CBD is combined really well with lots of things. And so from a, again, I use the word marketing, responsible marketing perspective, you can bring products to the marketplace and you can make claims on the combined products that you can make claims on while introducing the marketplace to CBD, getting someone to buy in and then educate them about the whole plant. In addition to that, I think as an industry, we do not do a very good job of policing ourselves. I believe that the DEA could actually be our friend and anybody who makes any medical claim should be raided and thrown in jail. 
I, mean, I really do believe that. Do not damage our industry by being a snake oil salesman. We don't need that. We need education and responsible marketing. Yeah, uh, you know, like Dr. Facebook and Dr. Google and these people that get all these people and then they make their, their groups private or closed or whatever the word is and then they start selling products and it's becoming, and it's like multi-level marketing and they're taking this potentially life-saving or life-altering medicine and turning it into Amway. So we only have a few minutes left here. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. So I'm going to come down if anybody wants to put up their hand that has any questions. Maybe you can meet me part way. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I was wondering what you guys think about the forthcoming legislation and whether that could bring prices down uh, create jobs, possibly bring down prices overall in the industry, or if you think that it could do the opposite, and how does that tie into just the overall uh, outlook on the CBD industry in particular? <laughs> Good luck with that one. I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so I think uh, you know the direct answer is we don't know and nobody knows. Uh, you know, but, but I think with that said, um, I think what's happening here is that the DEA uh, has lost the drug war, particularly against cannabis. And that is so obvious and it's, you know, it's, no one's pretending that there's a drug war against cannabis anymore or that they're even winning it. Um, and so what I, what I think you know, I'm seeing here, and you know, we sit on the board of the Hemp Round Table, we kind of are like involved in as much as we can be involved in, um, and, and have our finger on the pulse as much as we can. And, and I think what we're seeing is we're uh, seeing the passing of a, the enforcement um, to the FDA rather than the DEA. And so all of these things happening the way they have, where we have the uh, rescheduling of Epidolex, uh, that allows the FDA to step in on enforcement to effectively protect uh, a registered drug. Now, if you think about it in, in, in a pharmaceutical industry in general, and there's a good example in a, an ingredient called lovastatin, which is a, a, a statin drug. It was um, you know, researched by Pfizer. And, and there's that same molecule is found in red yeast rice. And, uh, and so prior to this drug being approved, while it was in the development stage, there are supplement companies who are selling highly concentrated uh, versions of lovastatin from red yeast rice. Now, as soon as Pfizer's drug was approved, it was Pfizer and Merck, but anyway, um, they, uh, the FDA then had this firepower to go in and shut down everybody. So what did they do in the supplement realm? Well, they went in there and they said, um, look, this is now a drug. It's, you're selling it in a way that is adulterated. It's, it's in violation of this. Now, the FDA has to enforce that to a degree because if they do not, then that supplement company with one millionth of the research cost and one thousandth of the production cost is going to undercut that drug every single day. So th that gives no incentive to the drug, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industry, um, which we think is bad, but it's not always bad. Uh, they're investing hundreds of millions into serious cures, and, and the FDA needs to protect that uh, investment into research. So um, I think that's what's happening, and that we may see increased FDA regulation and enforcement in the space. That said, we may not. The, you know, the FDA could very well, um, you know, come in here and, and issue some other guidance about CBD or hemp extracts, and all of a sudden it's a supplement, and it's sold everywhere. So I have a question. Um, you guys talk a lot about different CBDs and, and, and different effects. And then there's uh, extractors. But I'm sure there's some in Kentucky and some in Denver, Colorado, and some in Oregon. And you need to buy that from different areas. And as your company scale, you might even buy from different places. Or how do you go about buying it? And if it gets cheaper in Kentucky versus Colorado or I don't know, wherever it's going to be grown, probably everywhere, how do you think about purchasing it so that at least within your product, it gives the same effect? 
I, I don't me, I don't know if I fully understand the question, but let me okay, give a stab let me, at let it. Me, let me, I think we may have actually addressed it. Um, we were talking about the fact that in different plants grown in different places, there's variances. And because this is more of falling into a nutraceutical whole plant, there's an expectation of that and acceptance of that that the general public is more accustomed to than you would have in your single molecule pharmaceutical, for example, model. So I think that pretty well addresses that. Potato, potato. It depends on what you're doing with it, whether it's a commodity or not. In, you know, to the previous gentleman's question, and it ties in with yours, remember that the pending legislation is not about CBD. The pending legislation is about the ability to grow, cultivate, extract, and create products from industrial hemp. Correct. And so industrial hemp is not a plant that you get CBD from. I mean, industrial hemp is, in my opinion, the most powerful plant on the planet, and from certainly from a... Um, from a retail perspective, the things that you can do with it, the people it can feed, what you can extract from it, the whole thing. So, okay, Go, let's wrap that. The yeah. the point is that to to his to his answer, we we simply don't know, and the price is going to be based upon how that plant is grown, where it's grown, and what then is it a is it a raw plant, no CBD? Is it a 16% CBD plant? How it's grown? Who? It's it's all over the board. Right. Hey, uh, just uh, with everybody that's had some experience in the health business, if you will, what's the what's the good parallel that we've seen before as far as additives to health products? So, is this ginseng? Is this echinacea? Is this vitamin D? Is this what I mean, is some this? people some people say like omega three or fish oils was a huge you know that didn't really exist 10, 15 years ago. So this is like a this is like a unicorn. This is like a you know, a once in a epoch moment. Um, I mean, you think about it, that we have this, you know, uh, this, you know, endocannabinoid system in our body that we just discovered 30 years ago, and the one, the one plant that has the most concentration is the one that, that's been demonized the most. I mean, it's kind of, kind of ironic when you think about it. So it's, um, it's the sky, you know, you know, how blue is the sky, how there's a lot of white, you know, a lot of blue space to, to go. So it's really, it's pretty exciting, but it's also, it's going to be intense because there's going to be a lot of, so many claims. So it's, it, but in the health food business, people are really, you know, I mean, I was walking in the corridor, there's somebody that's a, a division of Procter and Gamble. And he says, John, where do we, where do we get CBD? He's like, Procter and Gamble. They're like, they're just like, when do we go? And they're not going to go to tomorrow. But you know when Procter and Gamble starts selling CBD, it's a pretty good-sized company. That's obviously going to going to going to ch change things. Now, what's the quality, et cetera? So um, you know, so I think there's a lot of there's going to be like wine. There's a lot of wine growers. So you know, focus on the varietal or focus on the flavor or the region or how you do it or how you connect with your customer. It's there's it's going to be a, a range of things there. Yeah, and decide whether you're going to be Gallo. <laughs> Or whether you're going to be, you know, a really fine, yeah, exactly. So. so my question is for doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. I have to ask this question for us. Because, yeah, I'm sorry, it's already laughing. Um, you said educating, and there are about maybe, maybe 13 med schools in the country that may even talk about cannabis of any kind. So for us, it's not that we don't want to know, but, beca but because we can't study it, we're ignorant. So pharmacists don't know, doctors don't know, nurses don't know. And we talk about it all the time. And I've read some of the studies about what it does, but if you want to educate people, you might want to start with us because people aren't going to ask their friends. If you start seeing the cannabis does this or does that, the first person they're going to turn to is their doctor or the nurse or the pharmacist. And they're going to ask us. And when we go, ooh, that doesn't look good for everybody who's trying to promote this product. So you might want to... Go ahead. You might want to consider. You might want to consider talking to us, just, you know, just as an experience, just to see if it'll help out. But I think it would. Thank you. Actually, um, we do try to educate our nurses and our doctors, and a lot of times what we're getting is not their resistance. Like for instance, yourself, we're getting resistance as they tell us. We, we want to know what you have to say about it. We want to know how this works and how and who it could benefit. However, it does not move beyond this point. 
because you're still limited. You're still not allowed to talk about it. Um, and one of the things that I've been telling a lot of my friends in the medical industry is, go to Colorado, go to the children's hospital where they treat children with medicinal marijuana. And it's on their website. Well, I promise that my company will focus on that next. Are you, are you a pharmacist? No, I'm a nurse. You're a nurse. May I give you an assignment? Go on Facebook. Start a Facebook group. Stay with me. Stay with me. So, again, I don't, I don't, have, any interest, I don't have any interest in being the popular opinion. Go on Facebook because the entire world is there. Start a Facebook group and invite your colleagues. And then once a week... Be a steward of the industry. Be a leader and be a true person. And find an educational element. Invite all your friends and educate them and ask the questions yourself. Invite a speaker. There are tons of speakers who will come into your Facebook group and speak with you. There are tons of studies and there's tons of science out there. And as a group together, ask your questions and get educated. Right. So, uh, right. Right. The other thing, yeah, and, and, and to your point, Mars, it's very important to understand that whether you call it a, a food supplement or whether you call it whatever it is you want to call it, it goes through the cytochrome P450 and it has interaction with any other drug that goes through the cytochrome P450, which makes a difference, which makes this a medically relevant question, which means it's a discussion that you need to have with your doctor, your nurse, your pharmacist. And if they don't know enough to know, they're just going to be scared and say, stay away from it. So I agree with you, and we can, you know, I help yeah, you some more on that. Part of the problem is there isn't enough good, solid scientific information to provide that. If you, any responsible person would at this point not be able to say, hey, this much CBD, this much whatever, for that situation, solid nutrition doesn't exist. So when you just say use it, you mean just type right it. You know what that really is in a lot of ways? One of the things, somebody asked me a little while ago, they were talking about our topical. And they said, oh, what's it for? And I said, anywhere you have skin, you know? I mean, what's it for? I mean, anything, anybody that says a product is for something, that's all about marketing. It's about the, the profile of the medicine, the, what's in the product itself. But the cannabinoids themselves are neutral as far as what they're for. So you can put a label on it and say, this one is for daytime. Well, that's going to have to do more to do with the terpenes. Or this one's for nighttime, and that's going to have to do with the terpenes or the dosing on it, uh, meaning the, how many molecules, how much you take, you know, the volume of medicine that you take, the quantity of the cannabinoids. But what they're for is what they're for on the way that they interact in the body, regardless of what your intention is when you actually take it. I think we're about out of time. Yes. Oh, if we're out of time, we're good. Go ahead. I think we had, did, was it, okay. was um, it a burning need? No. Yeah, burning need, okay. Burning need. Okay. Yeah, we got to, we got to. Okay, we're good. I, would, I was just wondering, it seems to me like FDA regulation on, it, it, at some point would have to come down the pipeline. Um, and I was wondering if anybody's paying attention to the research in Israel. 
you know, that's a that's um, a whole another forum pla panel. That's another panel. If we're going to start talking about science, I'll be sitting down there instead of standing up here because that's what I do is the science. So um, yes, Did anybody you had something you were going to? Oh, I was just. Say I, I mean, a couple comments over there. Uh, I wish we could tell you that so much, and and we're not there yet. And um, and it's such an like I said, such an early industry. And there's two ways that that information is going to come. One is from pharmaceutical companies completing three-phase clinical trials that allow them to say this much does this for this. And at that point, it will show up in medical school, and, and you will be taught that in medical school. The, the other way that that's going to come about is, um, is through partnerships and empirical evidence. And um, so it, there's very strict limits as to what we are able to say about our products and what they can do and how they're made and how they might impact the body. We can talk about the endocannabinoid system. There's types of educations that we can do. Um, before the end of the year, we're announcing a partnership with one of the largest supplement distributors in the healthcare practitioner channel. And, and part of our excitement in that is to be able to collect your feedback. So, so for patients who request it from you and, and are trying it and using it, like that's the information that's going to help us develop products and, and be able to explain it more. But never can you say this much of this will do this for this until you've proven it to the FDA in a clinical trial. Let's think of this in terms of biopharmaceutical. Yeah. Yeah. This is that's really the that's really the space where the cannabis uh, plant and, and supplements and medicines and near medicines and foods all fit is in the biopharmaceutical because otherwise you just become a single molecule. And like I always say on the on the THC side of things, if the single molecule like durabinol, marinol was any good, there would be you could buy it on street corners, and no one's trying to buy it. So that tells you that it's even though it's THC, it's still not it's still not a desirable. And I think that we have the same thing here. So let's keep it in the whole plant. Right. All right, all right. So um, I appreciate and I love your enthusiasm. It's fantastic, and I love to see the healthcare professionals, you know, gr jumping on board with this. So. I thank you. This is a very complex and very difficult topic, as you may have noticed. Every, there's a lot of difference of opinion, and there's a lot of we don't know yet, which can be very frustrating. But I hope that there was, uh, I want to thank all of you for bringing your expertise to the panel, and thank you.